John 14 this evening, John chapter 14. Thank you for that beautiful song there, The Old Rugged Cross. That song never gets old. And a blessing to hear that uh, report from the TNT trip. That's a, that's a tremendous blessing. And uh, I'm thankful for that and for the work of <clears throat> those that uh, work uh, in this way with people in our area. And um, I sometimes hear of you know, folks say that uh, it doesn't work to knock on doors anymore. And, uh, you know, the uh, Mr. Ramos should have preached tonight because he's going to hear a couple other illustrations that he just gave. Um, but, um, you know, that, that young boy that said, boy, I'm ready to, if the Lord wants me to preach, I'll preach. That happened because somebody knocked on his door. Somebody got by out of their lazy boy, walked out, grabbed tracks, bore some shame, had a couple doors put in their face. Uh, walked past and kept on going and kept on going and kept on going. And now, seven, eight years later, here he is. And uh, the lady that gave that money to help him uh, get to TNT was because somebody got up out of their lazy boy and grabbed some tracks, put a tie on, and went out and said, I am the Lord Jesus Christ ambassador, and I'm not ashamed of that. See, once we establish what the cause is in life, priorities, all of a sudden, they just they fall into place. Priorities with our time, with, uh, with, our, uh, with our heart, uh, with our finances, they fall in place once the cause is established. If the cause is blurry, then so is our priorities. And the devil loves it when a Christian has blurry priorities because he has lots of options to come right in there and fill those gaps and get people to fritter away their lives. But when the cause is clear, so is our actions, so is our mind, so is our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, uh, blessing to think of whoever it was that uh, said, uh, we're, we're going to go out and be those ambassadors that the Lord said we ought to be. Not going to be ashamed of it. So, young people, you want to cause, stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know it's unpopular. It's going to take courage. It doesn't take courage to not do that. Take courage to stand up and be counted for the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a life worth living. That is a life that the Lord uh, sees, and that's the pattern the Lord laid for us. Was he popular? Oh, for a short time. And soon after that, when uh, people realized that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about taking up a cross that we just sang, the old rugged cross, and we love that song, and I love that song. But it talks about bearing the shame of that cross. And I'm afraid that's where us 21st century American Christians have a hard time. Bearing the shame of the cross. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that saved our soul. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that paid the redemption price. And the Lord is, as he said, his eyes are running to and fro across the earth to find those whose heart is right toward him. He is wondering, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find that young person who is willing to be different and to have real courage in the Lord's eyes and to stand up for what's right and to be counted? Will he find that person in middle age that realizes it's great when you serve the Lord with your family together? And will he find that person who is up in years who stays by the stuff? When the Lord comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's the question that uh, we that the Lord asks, and I think it's fair for us to ask ourselves. We often ask ask ourselves, is what we're doing for the Lord in service for Him worth it? Is it worth it? And I think we need to answer that to the Lord, not to me. I know my answer when I see young people excited about putting the Bible together and getting it to other places, and uh, we got a hold of the uh, pastor in the largest city in Burma and said, how's your John Roman stack doing? He goes, it's empty. I don't have it. We could use that. Well, now that's a cause. To me, that's exciting. Something to work for like that and that know that there's people on the other end that are bearing the shame over there and that are mm, praying with real fervor because their existence depends upon it. And to be reminded of those uh, in um, the crescent world that are meeting two and three and four at a time in homes at the risk of their life and livelihood and, and think about the comfort with which we get to gather together and the blessing that this is and the fellowship that we have 
and, 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 and how we ought to take that blessing and invest it uh, in, 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 in getting the gospel out and living Christian lives and, and uh, keeping the cause clear before our eyes. We're uh, just a month or so away, less than a month away from the 21st anniversary of uh, 9-11. And it's interesting, sorry, this is going to date a bunch of us in here. Think about how old a person had to be to sort of remember what was even going on at that time. I'll just tell you, it's well into your 20s, like later 20s, to even remember 9-11. Now, if you remember it, you're like, that's yesterday. But there's a whole bunch of people in here like, tell me about this 9-11 thing. <laughs> oh, time flies, doesn't it? Time flies. But 9-11, clear cause, a united cause and a united, a clear need. So what happened? Every, all of us are driving out to try to find the American flag somewhere. We wanted an American flag in our yard, on our window. The cause was very clear. And there was a united, believe it or not, for a short time, there was a united spirit in America uh, because we, 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 we came together and it was our country that was under attack. They say that same spirit took place uh, on December 8th, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, same thing. And it energized the power of the American military to get into World War II, wow. A united cause with a great need and people stepped up to fill that. And so when the cause is clear and the need is clear, I believe God's people, us as God's people, can step into that gap and do what we say our salvation means to us. We can act on that. And we can't, we don't dare be passive or lethargic or apathetic or marked by the Laodicean church that we find in Revelation chapter 3 that was rich and they were increased with goods, and, but they didn't even realize that for the Lord's work they were, they were destitute. I, I don't want that to be me. We don't want that to be us. And so when the, the cause becomes clear, that, that prevents us from that and we respond in a way that uh, I think pleases the Lord. This is stewardship month, and certainly w w we need reminded, I think, of why we do what we do. Why do we give? Why does the Lord tell us to give? Why does he have so many promises for those that give uh, in Scripture? Well, John chapter 14, let's read a few verses here, and um, then I'm going to talk about the Number one driving force behind not just giving, but all of our life. John chapter 14, verse 13, the Bible says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. Those two prayer promises are not the theme of our message, but I challenge you to reread those before and after you pray. Those are prayer promises. Those are not for me. Those are the words of the Lord to you and I. The promises of prayer. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The very sending of the Holy Spirit was because the Lord knew we would lack comfort in this world. And one of the main blessings of the Holy Spirit is he brings comfort. Verse 19, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. I think verse 21 is very apparent that that driving force for what we do and why we do it all stems back to the love of God for us and our response Back to this love, responding to God's love, title of our message this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful service that we've had, Lord, the special that was sung about the Holy Rugged Cross, Lord, the blessings to hear about 
how you're working in lives. Lord, we ask that you would uh, bless this uh, time when we look into your word and, and then, Lord, in the time of prayer to follow. Uh, certainly there are many uh, people, ministries, missionaries, uh, there are many uh, churches, there's many church members here that are in uh, desperate need for answers to prayer in their life. And I pray, God, that our time with you would be uh, one, Lord, where fervent prayer is offered up from clean hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would bless our uh, bus ministry this weekend as we move toward the fall push. Lord, we're anticipating uh, you to move and work again. Lord, we know we're thankful for those riders that we have now, but we know just as when you walk this earth, same today, there's others out there. And I pray we'd be a part of that group that seeks the others, seeks the lost as you did, as you gave us example and command. Ask, Lord, you'd bless our stewardship month. Thank you for the privilege of giving. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would um, remind us and inspire us for some of the whys behind what we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So yes, 9-11, boy, there was charity, there was empathy, and there was resolve, and there was a family atmosphere in the country energized for a cause that needed to be taken care of. We are best driven to generosity and to obedience when before us is that great and worthy cause with the great need that goes with it. Certainly, Jesus is the prime example, the measure of God's love. And how is God's love really demonstrated throughout all of eternity? Well, we say this in uh, the doctrines class. God has uh, one, there's one strand, one stream running throughout all of Scripture. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, there's one strand that unites all of Scripture. Some call it the scarlet thread, the blood red thread. It's the theme of redemption. It is God's eternal plan of redemption. Jesus Christ is called the lamb slain, not on Calvary only, but slain from the foundation of the world. God's plan of redemption spans all of eternity. And what is God looking at when he is thinking of that plan of redemption? He's not thinking about, sorry, keeping the trees green and keeping, uh, keeping the temperature just right. His plan of redemption, he's looking at people. It's about people. That is what the redeemed of the Lord, the, who is redeemed? People are redeemed. People are saved. People are what dominated the uh, life of Jesus Christ when he was on this earth. It was about people. Jesus walking in the marketplace to talk with people. Jesus going into homes to touch and to heal those that were uh, sick, Jesus going in the synagogue to address those that uh, didn't believe in him and to, 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 to tell them about himself as their Messiah, Jesus going into foreign territory to deal with the Samaritans that uh, the, the Jewish people didn't want anything to do with, Jesus reaching down and picking up the little kids and putting them on his lap and saying, that of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus going over to the leper and reaching down and touching it. I'm saying God's eternal plan of redemption, that's a great doctrine, but it's a doctrine that deals with reaching people with the message of salvation. It revolves around people. Amen for every building and every program and everything that any church has that's seeking to serve the Lord and do right, but it's about the people. It's about reaching souls. And Jesus on the cross. What kept Jesus on the cross? It was his submission to his Father's will so that that Bible verse, John 3.16, could be quoted still today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That verse is there because the Lord Jesus followed the, his father's will in obedience and stayed on the cross when he had every opportunity to get off of it. Yes, the old rugged cross is a wonderful song. How, 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 do, we, how do we thank the Lord for that? We can thank him for what he's done for us, absolutely. Be grateful for our salvation. Is that enough 
Is that all of a response that we should have to God's love for us? Grateful for our salvation. Thank you for the good news. That's a start, and we ought to be grateful every day for our salvation. Is that it, though? Is that where it stops? Is there something more than that? If we have such good news, and we are sing about it and hear it preached all the time, if it's that good, isn't it worth sharing? Isn't it worth giving toward if the news is that good? If the love is so special and so, and, and, and so important to us, it is natural when we are loved to find some way to express our love back to, to somebody. I think that's why God gave the command to husbands, love your wives. If a husband will love his wife, think about what comes back. He doesn't do it because of what he's going to get back. But when we love someone and when we are loved, we're looking for some way to thank that person or show our gratitude or demonstrate that. That's, that's a part of how we work when we see great love to think, how can I do that back again, right? Someone does something really nice for you, goes out of their way, maybe surprises you with something so special. What can I do back for them? How can I show them that care? And the Bible says on the one end, for the person that says, I don't know, no one likes me, I don't have any friends. God gives us a solution for that too, right? Well, express God's love to them. You be proactive. What happens is love gets reciprocated back and forth, back and forth. And our life is a constant giving back to the, to the love that God has shown to us. That's a good way to live. That's a great way to live in this world. This idea of being a, a consumer and just looking to find the next thing that makes us whatever, happy or excited or just take in, take in, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be very, very shallow. It will end. The joy in that is so temporary. But love is a word that is an attribute of God. And as we love and demonstrate that love, we can't, we can't keep, uh, keep track of all the ways that God wants to bless us back from that. And it goes the same way with the word give in Luke 6.38. Give. That's a great verse. It says give. That's our part. That's a command. It's one word. The rest of the verse talks about all the ways that God is going to give back to us to where we can't contain it we can't keep track of it give and it shall be given unto you good measure press down shaken together shall men give into your bosom with what measure ye give it shall be given back to you again how are you giving how are you expressing and demonstrating the love of God in your life husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church he could not have loved the church more he gave his all for that so what does the church, let's make it uh, applicable and practical, what do we as members of this church do in response to the perfect love that Jesus Christ loved us with and gave himself? What's our response to that? What's our response? What's my response been? What's my response been this week? What's my response been? Did I thank the Lord today for my salvation? Did I, did I share? If it's so good, and so important, and eternity is so long, and heaven is so real, like we just sang, the pearly gate, we, we worked our way through it. And if hell is so real, what's our response to God's love? What is our response? What will we do? What will we do with that? Is it going to be love that is just not responded to? Or is it so valuable that we can't help but act on it how do we respond to all that God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ? For some, it's apathy. You know, thanks for what you did. Next time I need something, I'll come back around. It, boy, that's hard to even say. Hard to even imagine that that could be our response, but we've got to examine our heart. Maybe we don't want it to be, but, but has it been? Has it been an apathetic response? Has it been so-so? Has it been on and off, hot and cold? Here's some Bible responses to those that love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
quickly. Number one, they follow him. They follow him. Jesus' command was really, really simple to the early disciple, the first disciples, right? Follow me. Follow. That's a, that's a great motto for life. Just follow me. In the scriptures is everything that we should follow. Now, I'll say some follow Jesus for the wrong motives, and they didn't last real long. Some followed because he was the newest fad, and maybe he was going to be the guy that was going to make their life easier right then, and he was going to wipe Rome out. So some followed him because of that. Others followed him uh, because um, of what he could give to them. And by that, we're talking about he fed them. And uh, <clears throat> when the food wasn't there, maybe the next day after the 5,000 got fed, and they realized it wasn't going to be a, um, uh, that wasn't the purpose of why the Lord came, then they faded away. Jesus actually wondered at one time if even his disciples were going to leave. He wondered about them. In other words, he wanted to get down to their motives. He asked, are, are you all going to go away too? Because just prior to that, many people no longer went with him. So I will say this. Our understanding and commitment and belief in how God loves us and how the Lord Jesus Christ loves us will determine the longevity of our service for him or whether we are apt to fade away or to stop following him. There are others that just simply followed him out of, out of faith. And Jesus doesn't love us, so we'll like him and think he's popular. He loves us because that is who he is. Boy, if we could get to that place in our lives. We're not loving Jesus because, oh, it's the popular thing, or it's, it's easy to talk about him, or it's, he's, he's, he, Christianity is an acceptable religion. If we love him because he loves us for who he is, and we respond back. We cannot help but love him. There was a leper that got the, the grace and got the mercy of the Lord. Jesus walked and touched him and healed him. What, what hope did he have besides that? The leper got touched by Jesus, and Jesus said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I don't know if this is acceptable disobedience or not but the leper went away and told everybody right away are you gonna help but say look look at me do you remember you don't even recognize me the lord changed me and then the the demon possessed man can you imagine demon possessed and the lord healed him and saved him he went back and he told his friends and he told his family what had done god changed a leper god changed a demon possessed man God, if you are saved tonight, gave you a completely different eternity. Eternity in heaven versus eternal separation in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. What great love. In John chapter 14, we read verses 13 through verse 21. And I will say this. Those that love the Lord, number one, follow him. Number two, tell, they tell others what Jesus has done for him. And then number three, people who love Jesus, they obey him. They obey him. Look at verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Look at John chapter 15, verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then back to 1 John chapter 2. There's a reason why John is called the, uh, the beloved uh, disciple. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5. Uh, we, we know John loved the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, and he used this as a theme throughout many of his writings. 1 John 2, 5. Here the Bible says, but whoso keepeth his word, keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. It's made complete in that one that uh, keeps his word. And then 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. 1 John 5, 3. 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. It's stewardship month. One of the commands of the Lord is to give. Is that a grievous command? Not when we remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Not when we have a clear vision of the cause. And what is the cause? It's the same cause that, the, that, that God had from eternity past. It's the plan of redemption. And redemption is about people. When the cause is clear and the need is presented, the command to give, to tithe, to bring tithes and offerings and sacrifice, no, no, it's not grievous at all. It's joyous. And um, is to repeat what Mr. Ramos said, yeah, this trip helped me with my Bible and how I act. And now if the Lord wants uh, me to preach when I'm older, I will do it for the Lord. And that's a little seventh grade shrimp squirt little hillbilly that several years ago somebody said I'll be an ambassador I'll put a grab a tie grab some tracks I'm gonna go knock on doors I know it's not real popular I know not a lot of other churches are doing it is it worth it well then you ask your I know the answer I know the answer for my life I when I read that and that could be repeated Thousands of times over if people that were affected by the outreach ministries and the church ministries, you three-year-old and four-year-old and five-year-old saint with angel's wings, Sunday school and junior church teachers, okay? Yeah, that could be repeated. He was one of them. He was one of them. And we want to talk, start talking stories about change lives, we'll be here for a long time. We'll be here for a long time. But if our vision gets clouded and our eyes get on something besides the great cause and the great need, ah, maybe giving gets grievous. Maybe even attendance gets grievous. Ah, shame on us. Let's get that vision clear again. The cause isn't going anywhere. The devil's going to take all he's going to get. We need some courageous backbone people, young people to get out there and say, I'm an ambassador. Count me in. I'll be different. Count me in. Easy? No. Count me in. I'll be there. I will be faithful. Give? Huh. Yeah, it's going to be a hard life, though. No. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, shall be given to your bosom. You'll, we, none of us will ever outgive God. Never, ever. You can't do it. God promises that. You cannot do it. And so he asks us to do something and then tells us, you are going to be blessed because you do that. That's God's goodness and graciousness and magnificence is beyond anything that we could ever possibly uh, ask or think, the things that he has for us. Be faithful as a steward. Be faithful, God's word says. Is that hard? Depends on, our, depends on our, uh, the clarity of, 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 of the cause that's before us. Um, I was just reading something recently, I think it was 1990, I might be a little bit off here, world population 5.5 billion, today, if it's not eight, it's near it. I was already out of high school in 1990, and over two billion more people, our area has grown in population, some of our area has shrunk, but as a whole, our area is growing. The cause is great. The laborers are few, but, but we're in here. We're here. This midweek service, and we're here. It's a blessing to see this. We're here, midweek service, because we believe. We believe it got us up and out of our house into the church service because the plan of redemption is for people. And in Stewardship Month, we'll be reminded about this. And when it come time, comes time to give, his commands are not grievous. The need is great. Somewhere out there in 10 years, maybe somebody else will be up here and saying, here's something that we read from this boy or this girl. And, and 10 years ago, in 2022, during the fall push, somebody was out knocking on their door. And, man, they're saved. And they're the mom and dad are here in church. And... Wouldn't that be something? 
Wouldn't that be something? They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Lord, we thank you for our church. Thank you so much, Lord, for how you've blessed and used it. Lord, in a time of thinking of giving and stewardship, Lord, is on our heart. We're asking, God, that you would make clear in all of our minds the, the great cause behind it. Thank you for your love. May we obey you because of that love. May we be your ambassadors. May we see you at work, continuing at work uh, through our ministries, through our families, through our fellowship one with another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand again.